This is a GCSE Biology AQA Higher Tier Paper 2H from June 22. There are two types of reproduction, sexual repro and asexual. Complete table 1 to compare sexual with asexual reproduction. Write a tick in the box if the statement is true. The first row has been completed. Cell division occurs. That's true for both. Fertilization occurs. That's the meeting of two gametes. So, for example, a sperm and an egg. That's very much a sexual reproduction characteristic. Genes are passed on from parent to offspring. That is true for both. Offspring are genetically identical. That is a characteristic of asexual reproduction. Due to meiosis, you'll find that the offspring will be genetically varied unless you have identical twins. Gametes are formed in sexual reproduction. Name the male gamete formed in flowering plants. So here's your flower. And remember, you've got these anther and filaments, and the anther are loaded with pollen, which is the male gamete. Cell division by meiosis forms gametes. Figure one shows the mean mass of DNA per cell during, before and after meiosis. Use information from figure one to answer these questions. When is the DNA in the chromosomes being copied? So you'll see an increase in mass when that DNA is being copied. So it's down here between three and four hours. Cells divide twice during meiosis. Which two times in figure one show one cell dividing into two cells? It's down here where you see that lowering of the mass of DNA. So it's between five and six hours. What is the mean mass of DNA in arbitrary units in a sperm cell? So after meiosis has taken place, we formed our sperm cell. So that's why the mean mass of DNA is two. What is the mean mass of DNA in arbitrary units in each cell in an embryo? So you need to know that sperm cells are haploid. They contain half the genetic information versus an embryo whose cells will be diploid. So take your answer from the free previous part of the question and times it by two, so the answer here is four. Earthworms live in soil, feed on dead and decaying plant matter, have soft, moist skin, exchange gas through their skin, give two abiotic and two biotic factors that could affect the size of an earthworm. Abiotic factors are non-living. Biotic, biology, those are living. So temperature will definitely affect the earthworm as well as oxygen availability. You could have also said water, pH, mineral ions, texture of soil, biotic factors. So the presence of any pathogens, these are living factors. Obviously that will have an adverse effect on the earthworm as well as competition from other earthworms. You could have also said food availability, any presence of predators. Students investigated the populations of earthworms in the soil in two different areas. Area A, grass lawn. Area B, farmer's field. Chemical X can be mixed with water and poured onto the soil. The mixture brings earthworms to the surface but does not harm them. Plan an investigation using chemical X to compare the number of earthworms per metre squared in areas A and B. So what is our independent variable? What are we changing? We will use two areas. A, which is the grass lawn, and B, the farmer's field. What are we measuring? Count the number of earthworms. In areas A and B. Control variables, what are we keeping the same? We want the same species of earthworm. Same concentration of chemical X. Same volume of chemical X applied.
let's state a time frame. Five hours. Repeat five times in areas A and B and calculate a mean. Because this is looking at areas and counting earthworm numbers, hopefully you also realize that as part of the method, you're gonna be using quadrats, which have been placed randomly. It is important to control the concentration of glucose in the blood. Figure 2 shows how the concentration of glucose in the blood changed over 4 hours. Here's the meal eaten as you'd expect. You have that spike in blood glucose levels before it's brought down. Give one time when the concentration of insulin in the person's blood would be high. Now insulin, remember, is a hormone used to reduce blood glucose levels. When would that level of insulin increase? Well, it's when the blood glucose levels have increased. So you can actually say anywhere between 1.1 and 2 hours. I'm going to talk about this point here, about 1.6. Explain the effect of a high concentration of insulin on blood glucose concentration. So the effect is it reduces blood glucose levels. How does it do that? Insulin converts glucose into glycogen. People with diabetes have difficulty controlling the concentration of glucose in their blood. Type 2 diabetes is linked to obesity. Figure 3 shows how to find out if an adult's body mass is healthy for their height. Person A is 1.75 meters in height and has a body mass of 52 kg. What is person A's weight category? So 1.75 meters and 52 kg. So we're reading across here. Then up here. So where they cross is in the underweight category. Person B is 1.9 meters in height. Give the range of body masses that would put person B in the healthy weight category. We want healthy weight, so we read down. Use your ruler in the exam. Read down again. So I'd say between 68 and 90 kilograms. Person C is obese. Pers the doctor thinks person C may have type 2 diabetes. The doctor tests a sample of blood from person C. The table 2 shows the results of the blood test and the mean results for people who do not have diabetes. Type 2 diabetes occurs when body cells have reduced response to insulin. Give two ways the results of the blood test show that person C might have type 2 diabetes. You can see here that person C has a higher glucose concentration compared with the mean and that they also have a higher insulin level compared with the mean. Give two ways that a person can reduce the chance of developing type 2 diabetes. They need to reduce saturated fats and carbohydrates in their diet and they need to do more exercise. Remember, type 2 diabetes is definitely a behavioural treatment. The rapid growth in human population means that more waste substances are released into the environment. The release of substances causes pollution. Name one harmful substance that could cause air pollution. You've got so many options here. You could say carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide. Remember, carbon dioxide increases global warming. Name three harmful substances that could cause water pollution. Do not refer to plastic or litter in your answer. Sewage. Fertilizers leaching in from farmers' fields. 
just general toxic chemicals. Describe how substances that pollute air and water could be harmful to humans and other living organisms. Okay, let's divide the answer up then. So we'll talk about carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, sewage, fertilizers. So your answer could involve eutrophication, it can involve acid rain. So let's get going. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas which contributes to global warming. What effects does global warming have? This leads to ice caps melting, sea levels rise. and loss of habitat occurs. We also see extreme weather and change in bird migration patterns. So that's enough on carbon dioxide. Now we're gonna write about carbon monoxide. Obviously feel free to write that out in full. Carbon monoxide is toxic. Why? It combines irreversibly with the haemoglobin in red blood cells. So less oxygen is transported. Sulfur dioxide causes acid rain and damages trees. Leached or fertilizers which wash into rivers cause eutrophication, which remember starves the water of oxygen leading to death of aquatic organisms. Maple syrup urine disease, MSUD, is a rare inherited condition. MSUD is usually diagnosed early in childhood and can be controlled by having a low protein diet. Figure four shows the inheritance. The allele MSUD is recessive. Give one piece of evidence from figure four which shows that MSUD is a recessive condition. And you can see here, parents without MSUD have a child with MSUD, which means that they must both be heterozygous. Person seven and eight are expecting a fourth child. Determine the probability that the child will have MSUD. You should draw a Punnett square, identify the phenotype and use these symbols. So we're looking at persons seven and eight. Use the key, neither of them have MSUD, but we have a child down here which does have MSUD, which means they must both be heterozygous. So that means they have this genotype. So now we're ready to get going. Set out your answer like this. Start with the phenotype, they're both healthy, they don't have this disease. The genotype, I've just worked out. This means that the gametes are as follows. The mother's eggs are either big N or small N. The father's sperm, big N or small N. Now you're ready to do your Punnett square. So list the outcomes. So we have 
NN indicates a healthy child, as does lowercase n, big N, and that's 75%. And then 25% will have lowercase n, lowercase n, which means that disease. Figure 5 shows chemical reactions involved in the normal breakdown of some types of amino acid inside body cells. Some amino acids, enzyme 1 creates toxic substance P, produces ammonia, which is broken down by other enzymes to urea. Enzyme 2 breaks down substance toxic substance P to produce harmless products, a person with MSUD cannot make enzyme 2, so they're left with toxic substance P. One of the final products shown in figure 5 is urea, where in the human body the reactions shown in figure 5 most likely to occur, while deamination, so breaking down those amino acids, occurs in the liver. Scientists can analyse blood samples or urine samples to see if a person has MSUD, the test identifies high concentrations of toxic substance P shown in figure 5. Explain why the blood of a person with MSUD will have high concentration of toxic substance P. Use information from figure 5. Well, they've already told us that the person with MSUD can't make enzyme 2, which means that the toxic substance P is still made and allowed to build up. And then, that, then at that point, that toxic substance will diffuse into the blood, hence why the blood shows such high levels. You've got to point out that last point about P diffusing into the blood because of this bolded word up here. Explain why the urine of a person with MSUD will have a high concentration of toxic substance P. What will happen is that Toxic substance P, which we've already said, enters the blood. As it gets to that kidney nephron, it will go across that glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. And then it goes along the nephron where it is not reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule, tubule by active transport. Instead, it will carry on to the collecting duct and form a large part of the urine. Explain why a person with MSUD must have a low protein diet. Well, remember that's because proteins are broken down by digestive enzymes such as protease into amino acids. And obviously we want to reduce the number of amino acids to prevent toxic P building up. Energy flows through an ecosystem and materials are recycled. Figure 6 is the water cycle. Name process X. Here we have a lake, cloud. This is rainfall or precipitation. This is transpiration. So this here is evaporation. Name the process by which water is absorbed into plant roots while it moves from an area of high water concentration in the soil to a low water concentration in the roots. It is osmosis. Give two uses of water in plants. Remember it's needed in photosynthesis. It helps cool the plant. You could have also said it helps support the plant. It's used for the transport of mineral ions. Figure 7 shows the flow of energy through a food chain. The numbers are in kilojoules per metre squared per year. Make sure you take a good look at that. The cow is more efficient than the grass at converting energy. The conversion efficiency of the cow is this number. Calculate how many more times efficient the cow is at converting energy than the grass. The equation is this and give your answer to three sig fig. So let's use this equation to find out how efficient the grass is. So it receives 1.7 million but only uses 21,800 for growth. So that's how efficient the grass is. We know the cow is 4.098% efficient, so we need to work out how many more times that cow is efficient by dividing 4.098 by 1.282. So the cow is 
three times as efficient, but to three significant figures, it's 3.20. It is more energy efficient to rear cows indoors than rear them outdoors, suggests so why. If they're kept indoors, then they can't move as much, so less energy is lost in movement, and it's going to be warmer inside, so less energy is wasted keeping warm. give two possible disadvantages of rearing cows indoors. Now, annoyingly, they don't want any answers involving ethics, which is a shame because it is very sad for the cows to just be stuck indoors all the time. Instead, they want you to mention the fact that they'll be reared more intensively, so they'll be closer together, which will increase the spread of disease. You could have also said that there's the increased cost of heating those indoor enclosures. There could be more emotional stress reducing productivity, but they really don't want the word ethics mentioned there. You could say that they'd be fed more antibiotics. But I don't know why that's an assumption based on the fact they're indoors. A scientist found a polluted pond which had a new type of blue algae in the water. The blue algae was caused by mutation. What is a mutation? The spontaneous and rare change in DNA. The scientists measured the number of blue algal cells in a sample of the pond water. The scientists used a special slide which has a counting grid. This is the method used. Dilute 2.5 centimeters cubed of pond water to a volume of 10 centimeters cubed with distilled water. Place a drop of diluted pond water on the slide. Place a thick cover slip over the diluted pond water to give a depth of 0 0.1 mil millimetres of pond water. Use a microscope to count the number of algal cells in the 0 0.2 by 0 0.2 millimetre square. How many algal cells are in the 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 millimetre square? Use the following procedure. Count all the cells that are completely within the square. Count cells that are left, that are touching the left side or the lower side of the square, do not count ones touching the right or the top side. So let's follow those instructions. They've told us not to count these ones. So I'm gonna cross those out. And then we just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. One week later, the scientists repeated the test and counted 14 cells. Calculate the number of algal cells in one millimetre cubed of undiluted pond water. Use the scientist's second count of 14 cells. The first thing you want to do is find the volume of sample in millimetres cubed. So the way you do that is have a look at this information up here, and that's what I was doing here. You take the area and multiply it by the depth to get a volume of 0 0.004 millimetres cubed. Then we want to work out the number of algal cells in one millimetres cubed of diluted pond water because that's what we did in the experiment. So what we do is we take that 14, which was the number of cells they told us, divided by the volume we've just calculated. So that's 3,500 cells. And then we need to work out the dilution factor looking at the method so it says dilute 2.5 centimetres cubed of pond water to a volume of 10 centimetres cubed with distilled water. So the dilution factor is a quarter, which means we'd expect there to be four times as many algal cells in the undiluted water. So just times that by four. And so here's your final answer. Suggests why the scientists diluted the pond water before placing it on the special slide. Well, there'd be way too many algal cells to count in that case. A student repeated the scientist's method. A student used a thin cover slip over the diluted pond water instead of a thick cover slip. The liquid pulled the thin cover slip downwards slightly. Explain how the use of the thin cover slip would affect the results for the cell count. The fact that that thin cover slip has been pulled downwards slightly means that some of the liquid would drain away, meaning that effectively you have a lower volume, so there'd be fewer algal cells to count.
An echidna is a mammal that lives in Australia. Figure 10 shows an echidna. Figure 11 shows how the body temperature of the echidna varies in warm weather and in cold weather. Gosh, its body temperature changes massively in cold weather. Look at all those peaks. Figure 12 shows how the human body temperature varies. Far fewer peaks and troughs. Compare the variation in body temperature of the echidna in warm weather with the variation in body temperature of the human. Use data from figure 11 and 12. So make sure you're looking at the right lines. You can see that the echidna's body temperature varies from 27 degrees up to 35, whereas the human goes from, from 36.2 to 37.2, so it only varies by one degree. So the echidna is more variable. In the cold winter months, the echidna hibernates. During hibernation, the echidna's body temperature decreases to below 5 degrees. The echidna sleeps for 17 days at a time. Cute! The echidna's rate of metabolism slows down. Explain why the decrease in body temperature is an advantage to the echidna during hibernation. Simply because it loses less energy, as there is a lower temperature gradient between the echidna and the air. During hibernation, the echidna wakes up several times. Each time the echidna wakes up, it becomes active and its body temperature increases to over 30 degrees. Explain why the echidna has a high body temperature when it's active. So the echidna respires more to release energy to enable movement. Respiration releases heat. An echidna can dilate and constrict blood vessels in its skin. Explain how the dilation of blood vessels in the skin can help to decrease body temperature. So the dilation of blood vessels means that more blood flows closer to the skin surface. So more heat is radiated. This cools the blood, which cools the body. An athlete trained in a hot climate, the athlete lost a large volume of water each day in sweat. The athlete's energy intake each day from food was 20,000 kJ. Evaporation of one centimeter cubed of sweat requires 2.5 kJ. 40% of the athlete's daily energy intake was used to evaporate sweat. Calculate the volume of sweat the athlete lost each day. Give your answer in decimeters cubed. So we first of all need to work out what 40% of the daily energy intake was. So 8,000 kilojoules was used for sweating. We know that 1. centimeters cubed of sweat requires 2.5 kJ of energy. So do 8,000 divided by 2.5. So the athlete can make 3,200 centimetres cubed of sweat and then get that into decimetres cubed by dividing by 1,000. Suggests why the athlete was advised to take salt tablets each day to replace ions lost in sweat. Students investigated the response of plant shoots to one-sided light, so this is all to do with tropisms and auxins. Figure 13 shows how the students set up three experiments. So here's the light coming from the left, which means the stem bends towards the left. It's positively phototropic. Here's a light-proof box, so it's dark. So in this case, you wouldn't see that response. It grows straight up. And then in experiment C, we've got light in all directions. So again, we just see that shoot growing straight up.
suggest two control variables the student should have used in their investigation. You want to use the same species of plant, same temperature is a good idea. Describe how experiment B and experiment C acted as controls for the investigation. As I've already said, experiment B shows the response of the shoot is due to light because there is no light in experiment B, whereas experiment C shows the response in A is due to one-sided light because in this experiment there's light in all directions. Give two conclusions that the students can make from the ink marks on the sheet in experiment A. You can see by the spacing out of these ink marks that more growth occurs on the side furthest away from the light. So if the light's coming from this direction, we know that cell elongation is taking place here. And then that bending occurs because look at the spacing out of those ink marks, it occurs beneath the tip. Name the type of response shown by the seedling in experiment A, positive phototropism. Auxin is a plant hormone. Auxin is made in the shoot tip. Scientists invest investigated the role of auxin in the response of shoot tips to light. This is the method used. Grow four seedlings in the dark for a few days. Cut the tip of the shoot off each seedling. Place each shoot tip on a small block of agar jelly. Place the shoot tips and agar in different conditions. After 24 hours, measure the mass of auxin in the agar blocks. The numbers under each block show the mass of auxin that diffused into the blocks from the shoot tips. So from this shoot tip, we know that 25.3 diffused into the agar block. We've got a glass here. This has, been, this has been kept in the dark. So again, they're kind of quite similar. These numbers are quite similar. Then we have one-sided light, so we can see that auxin is diffused in much greater quantities to the left side, so the side furthest from the light. And then when we have glass separating both sides, because that glass lets the light through, we see very similar. A scientist made a hypothesis. Light causes auxin to move from the side of the shoot nearest to the light to the side furthest from the light. Describe the evidence from Figure 14, which supports this hypothesis, yes, that is definitely supported because, look, the key thing here is that auxin can move in this chute because there's no glass. So the glass here is preventing the auxin reaching this side of the chute. Another scientist made a different hypothesis. Light causes the breakdown of auxin. Give the evidence from figure 14 that shows that auxin is not broken down by light. The reason we know that that's false is if you actually look, it doesn't matter what's going on in terms of light levels, all four blocks have approximately the same mass of auxin.